for my first Z890 powered motherboard review, I decided um, to go for a tough motherboard because it is special, you see. It is probably the most focused motherboard in existence and it only cares about two things, being robust, resilient and being not too expensive. Pretty much very exciting. Today we are reviewing the excellent Tough Gaming Z890 Plus Wi-Fi, a board designed to keep you awake all night and accessorily um, uh, keep you virgin five solid years more than uh, you need it to be. Or nine. Um, starting with the obvious, our Tough Z890 features a solid eight-layered ATX format PCB foundation, which does ensure both a more stable and durable product. So in terms of fundamentals, and uh, uh, as I expected, the Z890 Tough, uh, uh, you know, uh, check. Uh, the fundamental, the foundation, the fundamental box. Design-wise, well, we have a much more monolithic, refined design which breathes precision at every sharp of its angles. The finish is subtle and gives an almost mineral contour to the blocks. I mean, look at this cut right in the middle of the aluminium metal, shaping that beautiful tough logo. RGB-wise, for the most part, Asus kept it suburb, but there is someone in the team over there who still holds on the year 2015 and tried to, to keep that tacky embedded RGB LED, which I really don't care about. Instead, I would much rather use the three RGB connectors already present on the board to express and paint my childhood traumas on my build. Most interestingly, chipset-wise, unlike AMD this year, Intel did roll out some real changes on its brand new Z890 chipset. For example, Intel took the previously available 8 PCIe 3.0 lanes and turned them into 4 more PCIe 4.0 lanes. Um, in addition, the Ultra CPU brings in 4 more PCIe 5.0 lanes. So basically, with the Z890 chipset, Intel is finally catching up on what AMD already had available to us on its X670E and X870E platforms. CPU socket-wise, we see the introduction of a brand new CPU socket with more pins to support a brand new class of Intel processors, the Ultra family, which despite less power consumption, promises to deliver more bandwidth, higher clock both on cores and on memory. Exciting, but on the downside, well, uh, um, all the previous processors are no longer supported. So if you want to have access to the ultra class of processor, you'll need to upgrade the entire motherboard. And that, that stinks. Now, VRM wise, the TUF is getting not an upgraded, but a fully redesigned power solution. The TUF stays loyal to the excellent Omega BFN0 power stages, which coupled with reinforced chokes are about the most resilient, resistant VRM you will find in the industry today. We're going from 60 to 80 amps power stages for a total of 1600 amps of juice in a 16 plus two plus one plus one configuration, 1280 of which are CPU centric. That is a 60% jump when you compare it to its uh, Z790 predecessor. And rarely will you see such a monumental increase a year to another. But being a VRM which will support several generations of ever more power hungry ultra processors, it does not surprise me one bit. Cooling wise, well, we have real cool stuff going on. The main VRM block is huge and features a white main wall to store harvested heat and a rather large, very large radiating roof uh, to get rid of it. In addition, we have uh, several long winglets to increase the heat expulsion ratio. The side block is not only dense and wide, but surprisingly long as well. I do not think ever seeing uh, uh, something that long. Finally, and as expected, we do have a double contact design, which will provide a direct thermal padded contact to both our power stages and chokes alike. Result in temps I have rarely or ever seen on such a board before, with an Ultra 7265K clocked at 5.4 GHz for a solid hour of synthetic stress test, the main block never went 
beyond 35 degrees Celsius. The highest I got was from the side block, which again, never crossed the 45 degrees Celsius limit, which is on its own super, super, super low. So in application, this is going to be the most durable, the most stable uh, board you'll ever run in your life. And I'm easily giving it an 8.5 out of 10 in terms of scoring. I mean, I would have given it a, a, a full point more if the two blocks had been linked by a copper pipe for a more homogeneous spread, heat spread. Still amazing, beautiful, gorgeous VRM. Big kudos to Asus for this. Now, RAM wise, well, the Z890 Tough can support up to 256 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM organized in a dual channel configuration with a maximum single clock speed of 9 gigahertz. I mean, three short years ago, we were wowed by DDR4 going at, at 4 gigahertz. Um, I mean, even if you compare it to the last year model, the Tough Z790, we have a 2 gigahertz jump. And obviously, you are going to see serious performance gain, both in gaming, most importantly in production, video editing, etc. But I do need to obviously mention that this kind of speeds will only be reachable with a single stick, but given the fact that now they can go all the way to 64 gigabyte of RAM, it's pretty darn awesome. Big, big memory kudos to, uh, uh, to Asus for this. Now, staying in the memory, well, thanks to the ultra processor additional lanes, the Tough finally takes full uh, ownership of the PCIe 5.0 standard. We have four M.2 solid state draft connector, including one PCIe 5.0 enabled connector right here, which by the way, got an insane amount of love. First, let us mention the fact that it does have a double thermal padding treatment again, very nice, but most importantly, we got that crazy hit plate. I, mean, I know 128 gigabit per second worth of data swap can get hot, but not that hot. It's pure heat expressing aluminum and they cut right in the middle of it. I mean, it definitely is overkill, but it looks so cool too. The other three connectors are all fed by four lanes uh, at PCI 4.0 standard, which is plenty fast as well. The two last ones are cooled by rather long and thick thermo padded heat plates, and the middle one received no cooling efforts whatsoever, and therefore I would use it uh, in last resort and would avoid placing any booting devices in that position. Now, worth noting, the M.2 solid state drive screwless mechanism has been completely redesigned and is now both easier and sturdier to be used and I absolutely love it. Now, talking of the DIY stuff, I also appreciate and love the main M.2 solid state drive plate latch. Easy and intuitive to use. Again, uber solid. But I am sad, disappointed to see that we still have screws on the mono heat plate. I mean, when I look at MSI efforts on the Tomahawk, which is, you know, the natural competition of the tough, kinda, uh, um, of removing every signs of screws, uh, it's hard for me not to expect the very same effort coming from Aces on the tough. So yeah, maybe uh, next time, tough, uh, Aces. Now, I would be amiss not to mention our loyal and aging setup logs here to service our legacy drives and it's done. Now, export-wise, well, it is a bit messy. We have five expansion ports, two of which are 16 slots and actually useful, but five, why? I mean, we're not in crypto mining era anymore, are we? Haven't we learned to better use our bandwidths, Asus? Anyway, I'm gonna uh, address the, the two 16 slots, the, the, the good ones, the, the real the ones you'll use. First, we have our GPU export, which is the only one to feature 16 full PCI 5.0 lanes, meaning this is where you need to place your graphics card for optimal performances, hence the metallic reinforcement, and this, the GPU unlocking mechanism, which, by the way, we had already seen on the Z790 BTF review uh, uh, last spring. The naked 16 slot is fed by four lanes at PCI 4.0 standard, which is fast enough to support anything from a capture card to a uh, PCI-based storage. Now, that's useful. Yeah, well, I'm still going to, to talk about those PCI exports. Those three little slots are doubly useless. First, because they are useless. And second, because anyway, we're gonna put a big chunky uh, graphics card on half of them, so obviously you're not gonna be able to 
connect anything onto them. I, I would have much rather have more back IO USB plugs than wasting and reserving all that bandwidth for nothing. Actually, we're going to be talking about this in a second, but before I do that, there's one good news. We have no PCIe bifurcation, uh, bifurcation, bifurcation, I don't know how you pronounce it. And good news for you because uh, you can finally use a PCIe 5.0 enabled storage and full 16 lanes graphics card without losing any bandwidth on an Intel power motherboard. And good news for me because I don't have to do all those annoying explanatory graphics. Now, back IO-wise. Well, apart from a somewhat okay-ish menu of USB plugs, what we need to pay attention to are these two type C's right here, which will provide us either a very fast 20 gigabit plug or even faster 40 gigabit data swap, which is crazy awesome. Now, I do need to point out that this little symbol right here means super fast charging for your phone, which you may already know I absolutely love. Next, our integrated graphic, which by the way are severely upgraded on the Ultra series, are serviced by no less than three display output. Connectivity-wise, we have the same search protected 2.5 gigabit LAN, nothing new here, but most importantly, we have an upgraded Wi-Fi 7 adapter, which will provide a near zero latency data swap. But for some reason, uh, the Wi-Fi 7 data transfer here has been cut in half instead of 5.8, which we can see on MSI or Gigabyte boards, here it's only 2.9. So yeah, I, I don't get it. And finally, we have a very worthy seven channel integrated audio solution powered by the excellent ALC1220P from Realtek, which does act much better than I expected, especially when I saw a rather limited 300 microfarads worth of cleansing capacitor, a, a good upgraded Bakayo. But in view of the competition, I worry a little here. I, I think the TUF would have benefited from a second USB 4 plug, which could have been fed by the bandwidth reserved on this useless exports. I'm starting to repeat myself again. I hate when that happens. Uh, also the Wi-Fi, half of the bandwidth, not happy there. I'm gonna stay nice. Um, room for improvement on the next iteration of this motherboard. That's what I say. Now, front panel connector-wise, well, nothing much here. We have the usual suspect. I do want to mention the rather fast Type-C, at least. Uh, other than that, we are in known territory. Uh, and cooling-wise, same story. We have our expected seven PWM fans, including an all-in-one water pump connector. And as far as I go, uh, and I might surprise you with that, I'm completely fine to have little to no evolution on the front panel connector front. The, the tough should stay focused on only implementing new features and connectors if absolutely necessary. A board with less components is a board which will last longer. You hear that, PCIe exports? Yeah. And as far as troubleshooting goes, well, we have our first aid, easy to bugger, for a vague troubleshooting experience and our flashback button for CPU-less BIOS update. Now, here is my only real critic um, of the troubleshooting. Again, MSI. On the Tomahawk, which is kind of the one of the natural competitors of the TUF, started this year to add a Q error LED or an error screen on their motherboard. And I don't see why Asus didn't do it on the TUF in response, because it's such a, an improvement when you're having problems with your motherboard and pinpointing exactly why it's not working. So again, Asus, I would love to see something going on on that side. Now, in conclusion, the Tough Gaming Z890 plus Wi-Fi will cost you about 320 bucks before taxes, which is, well, about 50 to 70 dollars more expensive than last year's iteration. And the big question is, well, is it worth it? Running the risk to, to shock you? I want to say a big fat yes. Despite some room for improvement and maybe a little bandwidth rerouting, the engineering, the heavy dutiness of the product marks it above anything Asus had released so far, at that price point at least. The competition might have a few features more, but none can claim to have both the reliability and power delivery 
we see on the tough. The VRM is splendid, both in its simplicity and efficiency. Fact of the matter, the computing delivery on the Ultra is so much better than on the older Core Intel processor, and Asus here made sure that you would get every performance drop out of it, whilst showing off an absolute master control of the thermals. So basically, we finally have Intel products who have a fair shot at competing against AMD. So this year is going to be really, really exciting to review. So in short, short, if you are looking for about the most resilient, the most power efficient motherboard there is, regardless of budget, there is nowhere else your money wants and needs to be.